Haskins. 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 Got it. Is it started? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Polly Hancock, and I'm reading Delivering Justice by Jim Haskins. Savannah, Georgia, 1932. The smell of Grandma's biscuits lured Wesley to the kitchen. Wesley was excited because today was Thursday, the day he would see his mother. The rest of the week, she worked for a white family just outside of Savannah, cooking, cleaning, and taking care of their children. This was her day off. Gram Grandma's friend, Old John, was sitting at the table. Wesley loved listening to the old man's stories. Old John had been born a slave, and he had taken he had he had been taken from his mother and had never known her. He was nine, Wesley's age. And he and all the slaves were freed in 1865. Wesley felt lucky. At least he saw his own mama once a week. Easter shopping at Levy's. Once a year, sometime before Easter, Grandma would take Wesley down to Levi's department store on Rotten Street to buy one nice outfit. They used the Levi's charge card and then paid a little bit each month. On one shopping trip, the saleswoman would not serve them until after the white customers had been helped. Wesley had heard the saleswoman politely call the white woman customers Miss and Mrs. But she treated his grandma as if she were a child, a nobody. Wesley's grandma pretended not to notice. She was polite, but she was also proud. Come on, she said, it's time to go home. They left the store without buying a thing. Segregation. Back then, black people were treated, uh, weren't treated as well as black white people. Most of the time, they were kept segregated from whites. Wesley went to a separate school from black children, for black children. He had to drink from the water fountains marked colored. He could not sit in, at the Levi's lunch corner. His grandma's prayers. Sometimes Wesley got angry with black people or that black people were mistreated and that no matter how hard his mother worked, they were still poor. But his grandma was always there to talk to him. She understood why he was upset, but she didn't want him to have bad feelings about himself. She said that no matter how he was treated, he had no excuse not to be somebody. She told him again that the day, um, again about the day he was born. She said, I got on my knees and prayed that you would grow up to be a leader of our people. Wesley promised himself that he would fulfill his grandma's prayer. She also promised, he also promised himself that he would work so hard that one day his mother would not have to work in someone else's house. Voter schools, 1942. Wesley knew that many black people didn't vote because they had to pass a test to register. The test was designed to be difficult for black folk to pass. It was intended to keep them from voting. Wesley was a member of the Youth Council of the NA NAACP, the National Association for the Advance Advancement of Colored People. The Youth Council started a special vote, started a special voter in the basement of, of a church with a friend Clifford with his friend Clifford, Wesley talked to everyone, even passerby, passersby about voting. When he found someone who, scared by the test, had never registered to vote, he took them to the voter school. When they finally, um, when they felt ready to take the test, Wesley went with them to the courthouse and stayed until they were registered. With Wesley's help and encouragement, many black people in Savannah beca uh, became registered voters. Working as a mailman, 1949. After college in the army, Wesley went to be a teacher. But because of, the, of his membership in the NAACP, no one in Savannah would hire him. So Wesley became a mailman. The Postal Service hired qualified people, regardless of their color. As it turned out, the job suited Wesley just fine. 
Good morning, Miss Sally Lawrence Jenkins, Wesley sang to the young woman in her garden. Here's a letter from your sister. Wesley liked to address people by their full names. He could trace a person's history by their name. And history was important to Wesley. If you don't know where you've been, how will you know where you're going? He asked her, he loved to ask. At the NAACP office, February 1960. After work, after work, Wesley spent long evenings at the NAACP office. One night he was visited by a group of students who were excited about what was happening in Greensboro, North Carolina. Young black people there had staged a sit-in at a lunch counter in a local store. They refused to leave until they were serviced or served. The students standing in the front of the West in front of Wesley wanted to do the same at the department stores on the Broughton Street, but they needed a leader. Wesley remembered how his grandma had been treated at the Levi's and he agreed to help. But first the students had to be trained. They had to protest without ever using violence, even if the other side did. If they were attacked and they fought back, Wesley told them their cause would be lost. Levi's Lunch Corner. After weeks of training, small groups of students made their way downtown, entered the big stores along Broughton Street, and sat down at the lunch, at the lunch counters. The store refused to serve them. At Levi's, the manager called the police, who arrested the students for breaking the city segregation laws. Throwing down their cards. Wesley called a mass meeting the next Sunday at the Bolton Street Baptist Church. People filled the pews and balconies. Wesley opened the meeting with a hymn. All the voices singing together made a, thund a thunderous sound, and the mighty noise made people think that, per uh, that perhaps working together, they could really make something happen. Wesley spoke about the arrest of the young people at Levi's. He said that things had to change, and, if he had, and, and he asked people if they were ready to fight for their rights. Someone shouted, I'll never shop at that store again. Then someone in the balcony threw down a Levi's char charge card. Soon everyone was tossing cards into a big pile in the church. The boycott begins March 17, 1960. The next morning, Wesley led a group downtown. They carried baskets full of charge cards. At Levi or Levi's West... At Levi's, Wesley and his group dumped the basket of charge cards in the, onto the sidewalk. Then Wesley announced that no black people would shop at any store on Broughton Street until they were treated equally. The Great Savannah Boycott had begun. Picket Lines Wesley and other members of the NAACP organized a, pick, uh, a picket line every day in front of Levi's. White people yelled and um, jeered at the protesters and tried to force them off the sidewalk. But day after day, the protesters returned. One day, a large burly white man punched one of the demonstrators in the face and broke his jaw. But everyone remembered that Wesley, what Wesley had taught them. They didn't yell or fight back, no matter how much they wanted to. Wesley organized other protests. They were. Uh, there were kneelings in the white churches on Sundays and wait-ins at the all-white beach in Tabai. T Tabai. Wesley wanted to end segregation everywhere in Savannah, in libraries, theaters, public pools, beaches, and restrooms, as well as at lunch counters. Talking about peaceful change. Large meetings were held every Sunday at different churches. Protesters talked about their activities. Some gave fiery speeches. The meetings became so popular that no church was big enough to hold everyone who wanted to get in. For a year and a half, no one from the black community shopped at um, Broughton Street. Wesley walked down the street and started counting. One, two, three, four, five, going out of business signs. 
The white store owners couldn't stay in business without black customers. When he delivered mail to white people, Wesley told them how much he loved Savannah. He wanted the city to be a better place for everyone. They respected Wesley. They saw how peaceful and committed to change the protesters were. Little by little, more and more white people began to sympathize with the, white pro or with the black protesters. Desegregation without violence. White people in the community who supported Wesley asked what they could do to end segregation and stop the boycott. Together, leaders from the white and black communities worked out a plan. Each evening, after delivering the, mail, delivering the mail, Wesley organized a group of students to sit in at a different kind of business or facility than organized a group of students to sit in at a different kind a, a different kind of business or facility the next day. The theaters would be first, then the restaurants, then the library, and on down the line until every business had been desegregated. Sometimes angry crowds would gather or white people would leave in protest when black students arrived. But most of the white and black leaders stuck together. The mayor made sure that all signs marketing um, separate facilities for blacks and whites at City Hall, the courthouse, health department, and hospital were taken down. City officials took the segregation laws off the books. Unlike, desegrega unlike desegregation efforts in other cities and towns in the South, South, there was very little violence in Savannah. Justice delivered. On, Sunday in, uh, on a Sunday in September 1961, Wesley greeted the hundreds of people who, were, who arrived at downtown Savannah Church. Inside, their voices joined together to sing out, we are, soldiers in God, we are soldiers in God's army. When the song ended, Wesley stood in front of the crowd. He saw his mother sitting in the front row. He saw, see, he saw students who had been arrested. He saw faces beaming with pride. Then he announced in a loud, clear voice, we have triumphed. Savannah was the first Southern city in the United States to declare all its citizens equal. Three years before the Federal Civil Rights Act made all segregation illegal. Pe people, both blacks and whites, saw Wesley as Savannah's hero. He had kept the protests disciplined and peaceful, even in the face of violence. Modestly, he would say, I was just doing what every black American should be, black American should be doing. Wesley Wallace Law delivered more than just the mail to the citizens of Savannah. He delivered justice too. His grandma's prayers had been answered. Afterward, until his death at the age of 79 on July 29, 2002, Wesley Wallace Law, known to most as WW, continued to fulfill his grandma's prayers. He worked tirelessly to end racial discrimination and to fight for justice. In September 1961, during the final days of the boycott, W.W. was fired from his job as a letter carrier. Then um, when U.S. Representative G. Elliott H Hagan made him, a made him a campaign issue, Hagan promised to get rid of the troublemaker from the NAACP. But in October, President John F. Kennedy became his defense and W.W. was reinstated with back pay. He continued to work for um, work as a mailman for 42 years. He served on the National Board of Directors of the NAACP for 30 years. He was he and he served as president of the Georgia branch of the NAA, NAACP for 13 years. He faced intimidation and death threats. Medgar Evers, a NAACP field secretary, was murdered outside of his home in Mississippi in June 1963. W.W. narrowly es um, escaped an attempt on his own life when the NAACP offices in Savannah were attacked. He said that he could never marry or have children because it would be too dangerous. Ever since W.W had been a young boy listening to the story of his elders, he believed in the importance of history. Preserving and teaching history to young people became his crusade. And in the 1970s, he began a project restoring grave sites at Laurel Grove South Cemetery, a predominantly black cemetery in Savannah. He found the Savannah 
Yamacraw Yama branch of the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History and created the Negro Heritage Trail Tour of, Histor of Historic Savannah. He organized the Beach Institute Historic Neighborhood to preserve Savannah's only remaining downtown black neighborhood and to pre prevent black displacement from the inner cities. He spearheaded efforts to restore the King Tide Title Cottage and Beach Institution. In February 1996, W.W. was chosen as the only Savannah, Savannah Inn to have his likeness included in the mural of the Atlanta Centennial Olympic Wall. It was because of WW's vision at the Ralph Mark Gilbert Civil Rights Museum in Savannah was established. Among the awards WW received, many were for many were for his work at the pre, present preservationalist. He was awarded the Historic Savannah Foundation's Davenport Award and the first black Savannian to re receive the honor. The Distinguished Ge Georgian Award by the Cin Center of the Study of Georgia History and the National Preservation, awarded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation for Lifetime Achievement. He was also awarded with the highest honor from the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation as a pioneer in the African-American historic preservation effort in Georgia and a dynamic leader in Savannah. He never took money from, for the public service work that he did, choosing to live on small wages he earned from the United States Postal Service. He wanted to live just as an ordinary citizen and teach by example. Living frug frugally, never owning a car, never buying fancy things, he was able to fulfill his lifelong dream. He sat his mother down one day and told her that she would not have to live and work in somebody else's house anymore. She could finally stay at stay home in the house he had bought for her. Thank you.